What inspires CBC long list author Morgan Murray? Let's find out. But before we do, to keep up with the latest author interviews, please hit that subscribe button on the bottom of your screen. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to a special episode of All About Books. To celebrate the Dirty Birds Canada Reads World Tour, I'm delighted to have author Morgan Murray as a guest today. And did you know that Morgan grew up on a farm near the same backwoods central Alberta village as figure skating legend Kurt Browning? He now lives in the backwaters of Cape Breton and his debut novel, Date Dirty Birds, was published by Breakwater Books. Welcome to All About Books, Morgan. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you. So a lot of excitement this week for you. Um, Dirty Birds, um, coming of age story set in 2008 recession. And it follows a young man, Milton, Ontario, who decides to leave his hometown, and I love this name, Belly Button, Saskatchewan, and move to Montreal to pursue fame and fortune and to find his beloved idol, Leonard Cohen. And it is, it is just crazy and such an, enjoy, an, an enjoyable read. So congratulations, congratulations. Thank you so much. And would love to hear, uh, Morgan, how did you find out that you were long listed? I got an email from uh, my publisher uh, last Monday morning, the morning before they announced the short or the long list and mm -hmm. uh, had to keep it a secret for 24 hours. Um, yeah. My wife found out pretty quickly when I was hooting and hollering. And uh, <laughs> Then, uh, yeah, they, they announced it publicly the next day. And uh, since then, it's been a whirlwind and it's been really exciting. And we've managed to set up a bunch of events. And unfortunately, it didn't make the short list, but uh, just to be long listed with those other books and, and just to um, even be on the radar of something like Canada Reads is, is really exciting, especially for a small little book from a small little part of the country. So uh, we're, we're all thrilled with, with the long list and everything. What like what a way to kick off your literary career as a novelist? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see it coming at all. I didn't expect it whatsoever, and uh, yeah, to wake up to that email on uh, Monday morning was quite the treat. So uh, I'm very happy with it. Well, I'm excited for you, and keep all that happy dancing going because it is such a a great honor. So. Your narrator, the lovely Milton Ontario, and these are your words, he's never kissed a girl. He's incredibly spectacularly, spe spectacularly remarkably average, plain, boring, humdrum, blonde doll, beige down to his very soul. Morgan, how did you come up with this character? <laughs> well, unfortunately for me, um... Milton resembles uh, a certain version of myself. From that time. <laughs> I was young and dumb once, and uh, so I tapped into a lot of that experience and 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 kind of went from there. Uh, it, Milton he graduates from college in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and moves to Montreal to become a poet and a ladies' man like Leonard Cohen in 2007. And uh, in 2006, seven, I graduated from the University of Calgary and moved to Montreal to become a famous poet and ladies man like Leonard Cohen. And neither <laughs> of us succeeded, but I got out of it a lot more unscathed than poor Milton did. <laughs> um, your novel, like it is such a fun read. When I was reading it, Morgan, there was times when I was like, oh my gosh, like just caught between awe and just, I can't believe this is happening. Like the <laughs> riot is just, it's just unbelievable. So I have to ask, where did you get the ideas for these crazy misadventures that Milton gets into? Uh, a lot of them were uh, started with the kernel of something that really happened. So uh, the egg riot, <laughs> There was no egg riot in real life, but there was uh, 
a festival in Montreal called Nuit Blanche, which is, is an all night art festival and they have different art all over the city. And uh, the year I lived in Montreal, me and a few friends went and um, it takes a lot of stamina to watch weird conceptual art all night. So <laughs> usually you're very tired and there's people sleeping everywhere. Um, but the, the culmination of the festival was this free uh, egg breakfast in, I don't know, I can't remember if it was a bank or not, but uh, it seemed like it was a bank. And it was, they were delayed a long time and, and there were just people strewn all over the, this like food court mall thing. And if you know Montreal at all, they have like an underground city in the, between the metro stations and everything and underneath the downtown. And so there's just people everywhere just like sleeping at five in the morning waiting for these eggs to be cooked. <laughs> and it didn't end up in disaster. The, eventually the eggs got cooked and they were, as you could imagine, a giant vat of eggs. They were disgusting, but everybody got their eggs and went home. So I just embellished it as much as I possibly could and uh, <laughs> put Milton through his paces a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> As like as a writer, that must have been so much fun. Like just letting yourself go on all these crazy antics. Like, oh gosh. Yeah, there were times when I would uh, be chuckling away to myself while I was typing, and uh, I wrote most of it at the dining room table while with my headphones on while my wife was uh, many months pregnant sitting on the couch watching tv in the next room and she'd hear me chuckling to myself and wonder what i was if i was going crazy or not but uh it, it was fun to kind of uh revisit a, an older version of yourself who was very naive and, and dumb and uh really put it to them <laughs> And another element, like I love that, le like singer, songwriter, and poet Lo Leonard Cohen, it, like he is Milton's hero, his absolute hero. Uh, why did you decide to give Leonard Cohen such a prominent role in your novel? Well, for for one, Leonard Cohen, he kind of cultivated this uh, character of himself in real life as this sort of tortured poet if you think of poet you think of Leonard Cohen with the fedora and the yes. you know the sad gravelly voice and yeah uh, he was in reality this like super famous pop star but he always cultivated this this image of the poet and the ladies man um, and he became and I don't know if he he I'm, I'm sure he was in on it because he was a, seemed like a pretty smart guy but he became this kind of caricature of a certain type of man and artist and and he became a sort of symbol more than than just a person. And so I wanted to take that symbol and um, use it as sort of Milton's guiding light as his, his God was Leonard Cohen and he set out to find God and he, he found God and it didn't turn out at all what he thought it was going to be like. And Leonard Cohen becomes kind of his nemesis um, and causes him all kinds of trouble because it part of the thing that I wanted to look at with the book is sort of um, much like my own journey to try and become a human being is how do you become a decent human male, white, straight, ordinary guy in a time when things are changing a little bit where um, for centuries and centuries, the straight white male, middle class, upper class person like me kind of had carte blanche to do whatever we wanted without consequence. But that's still happening way too much and we're still electing way too many of those people to run things, but um, there's starting to be questions asked and there's starting to be sort of marginal voices that we haven't heard for a long time starting to speak up and be heard and question and say, maybe it's not right that we give this one group of people who have destroyed everything, all the power <laughs> all the time. Um, and so Leonard Cohen was a was great symbol of a certain kind of masculinity that isn't always yes. a positive one because he was, I listened to way too much of his music and, and, and did a lot too much research uh, in writing the book. And uh, a lot of his songs are sort of creepy songs about uh, chasing women or being scorned by women. And some of them are very inappropriate and some of them are so vague, but catchy. We play them at funerals and things when really we probably shouldn't be. So yeah, yeah. He's a, he was a useful symbol, a useful, a useful tool for the book. 
Were you worried at all, Morgan, because uh, Leonard Cohen is so beloved that people might be, wow, you know, what, what's he done to, to our <laughs> Canadian hero? Any of those concerns for you? There, there was, and, and uh, me and the editors and, and a few friends who I had look at the manuscript, um, one of their first questions was always, does this have to be Leonard Cohen? Could it be somebody <laughs> like Leonard Cohen, but not Leonard Cohen? Yeah. Um, but I, it was, it was a useful conversation to make sure that I was, uh, knew what I was trying to do. Um, but I felt like it had to be Leonard Cohen because he, he was such a symbolic godlike figure and he's so revered and there's, uh, you know, huge murals of his face in downtown Montreal to this day. And uh, I used to live in St. John's, Newfoundland for a long time. And every Christmas they would have a feast of Cohen where people would play Leonard Cohen songs and thousands of people would come and it was like this religious ceremony, um, and, which struck, struck me as odd all along because he was effectively just a pop singer. Um, but it, it became more and more odd the more I dug into it and the more you dig into his lyrics and some of his lesser known songs are more on the nose and they're just creepy, like yeah, yeah. pretty icky. And so I had less and less of a problem of, of sort of problematizing Leonard a little bit. Because um, in this day and age, he probably couldn't have got away with a lot of the shenanigans and songs and poems he wrote in the 60s because it was a different time, a different place. So I'm, I'm not too worried he'll haunt me or anything. <laughs> um, another element, Morgan, of your novel that I really enjoyed was um, the illustrations and also your footnotes, which are scattered throughout. Can you explain the significance of this to um, to your to people who are watching the program now? Sure. So um, there's a number of footnotes, and and mostly mm -hmm. at the beginning when I'm sort of explaining Milton's world and, and kind of where he's coming from. There's a lot more, and then there's fewer as the book goes along. And it's sort of the same with illustrations. I think there's 60 some illustrations throughout the book. Um, I can show you some too. Uh, yeah, perfect. I got, I got enough books here. Um, <laughs> so there's a picture of uh, the cuts of meat on a horse, you know. Yeah. Um, and and he, he gets a job at a call center and these are the <laughs> yeah. incentive rewards. Um, so there's a number of pictures of, of, of different objects and things in his life. So uh, with the footnotes, first of all, I, I wanted to uh, do two things, make it funnier. So some of the footnotes are jokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Milton, on, Milton, Ontario, the place is, is named after John Milton in a roundabout way, but John Milton's um, poem Paradise Lost is not about the GTA. <laughs> That's the yeah. first footnote in the book. Um, and then other footnotes explain actual history of the place yes. that Milton was either from or, or, or Quebec, um, Saskatchewan or Quebec mostly. And um, I wanted to do that because I wanted to sort of shine a light on the fact that Milton, like so many of us in Canada, are ignorant of a lot of the history of the place that we're from. And we're disconnected from, um, you know, thousands of years of Indigenous history. And in, in the case of Saskatchewan, I, I have a few footnotes about uh, the village belly button uh, is based on the village where my grandparents are from which is called Riverhurst and it's on the banks of Lake Diefenbaker which is a man-made lake made by John Diefenbaker the former prime minister <laughs> he, they built two dams while he was prime minister and named the lake after him um, and at the bottom of the lake is this very important indigenous um, monument so sort of so to speak of uh, it was a rock, a, a huge rock that kind of was shaped like a buffalo. And so it became this sort of sacred meeting place for um, different first indigenous groups and communities and things for centuries. And when they were building the lake, they, uh, the indigenous communities, the, the leaders asked if they could move the rock or, or, or take the rock out from the, where the lake was going to be. And uh, instead of figuring out a way to pick up a big rock, the government um, just blew it up. <laughs> stuck it full of dynamite and blew it up and offered little chunks uh, to the different First Nations communities. And most of the rock is still at the bottom of the lake. And I think some divers found it recently and, and it was a, a fairly significant thing. But 
just outrageous historical things like that and, and, and a number of other things. And then a lot of the Quebec history, I go, Milton has no idea about. And so I kind of race through that and, and provide some footnotes as context. Because Milton is coming from this place, uh, Saskatchewan, um, which is literally just a square drawn on a map by somebody who'd never, ever been there. I guarantee you, because you don't just draw a square on a map because it's not a square flat continent. It, there's geography. There's history. There's there's all kinds of things that they just erased with the drawing of the square, uh, and then he moves to Quebec, which has a very complicated political history with yes. the French and the English and the Indigenous as well, and Milton's completely oblivious to all of this, and he lives in this Anglophone bubble. Um, so for me, I wanted to show the the sort of consequences of being disconnected from that, and Milton is, is sort of adrift, and he's looking for a meaning and purpose in his life, but he has no idea about where he's from or what he is his heritage is or what he's connected to in any meaningful way and so he's he's kind of doomed to fail from the beginning because he won't acknowledge any of this and then with the images um sort of the same thing to make more jokes where i could i've always loved uh novels with illustrations in them just to give your sort of eyes a break and give yeah. you something to yeah. look at and, and scratch your head over um, but also to show sort of a collection of objects in Milton's life and the things that were important to him. And, you know, the, one of the first illustrations is, is uh, everything he packed in a suitcase when he goes on. Yeah. His own. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And it, it's a portrait of Milton. It's, you know, his record player, yeah. and his books and his seven socks and three pairs of yeah. underwear. And, and and as the book progresses, you know, that you get things like this, which become important mm -hmm. objects in his life. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you why, uh, not to ruin it, but um, sort of, it, it was a tricky to figure out how to use them exactly, but I was satisfied when you kind of flip through the book and you can see the pictures and it sort of tells the story of Milton's life through these objects, yes. like they're exhibits yeah. in a court case. <laughs> and yeah. you just kind of see the progression of, of well, the, the regression of Milton as you go through these these images. So it was, I, I don't think I figured out how to use footnotes and images perfectly, but it was a fun experiment and I'm glad the publisher <laughs> let me get away with it. Well, as a reader, I, I really enjoyed it because it does add a, a, a totally different dimension to the novel on a visual level, but also on a learning level with all your fit, footnotes. So I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. What are you currently working on right now? Uh, well, right now I'm working on uh, milking this Canada Reads long list for every <laughs> yeah. thing I can. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, this last uh, week and a bit has been just uh, a dizzying uh, few days trying to set up a number of events. So I think I've got an event or an interview or something every week now until almost the end of March, which is fantastic. Fabulous, um, yeah. And in, in the meantime, I'm trying to figure out what my next book is going to be because apparently people enjoyed this one choice, so I should write another one. <laughs> yeah. um, and I had been planning on kind of writing a nonfiction book based on uh, my master's thesis, but uh, with the reception this has got and, and now it's starting to get a little bit of national recognition, I think, um, I don't know if that would work so well to come out with a pretty dry nonfiction book. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I, I have an agent now and I'm gonna uh, talk with her about uh, kind of what the best approach would be. And I got a few ideas for novels and see which one uh, kind of shakes loose first. <laughs> and go from there. But for now, it's, uh, we're just making hay out of, well, the sun shining out of this, uh, out of the blue long list mentioned, so. Oh, well, well, enjoy it. And we will look forward to whatever comes, <laughs> comes next from you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So Morgan, a great, great big thank you for coming on this week's episode of All About Books. It was a pleasure to meet you, learn more stories about behind your book. And I will put links down below so watchers can find you on your website or purchase a copy of your book. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.